the, the thought that came to me just before I came on was the fear of swimming for some reason. And I wanted to ask you, it's an odd question to start with, but what does that mean to you, the fear of swimming? When I say that, does that resonate with you in any way, whether literally or metaphysically or in any way at all, the fear of swimming? The first thing that comes to mind are my clients. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Um, and well, most of the persons I teach to swim, especially the adults, um, have a fear of swimming and fear of the water. And it's something that I feel is, it is it's a cultural thing and it's very deeply rooted. Um, and and it's, so it's, I, I see where it comes from. And it's for me, it's something that I have, I, I really enjoy the process of helping persons to overcome. Um, it's, it's one of the most rewarding parts of what I do. Um, and I, I like to see people t over, like build their confidence very, very slowly, but build their confidence and overcoming something that's just this, this space that's just incredibly delightful and meaningful for many, many people around the world. But I think we've just had this separation from, from this this body of water and just generally bodies of water we have this disconnect in terms of it being a place of joy where it's it's a place of fear instead and it's a place of fear because we haven't been given the skills or haven't been and we haven't as a people generally speaking haven't had the, the institutionalization of, of 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 swimming skill development it's not, it's not part of our school systems. It's not part of, you have to make a concerted effort to go out of it, to go and find it. And even when you do for a long time, it was very limited. Um, and so, you know, it's, it, it just means that I have, feel like I have an opportunity to, to change person's perception of, of, of the water. And the water for me is a very magical place and a very safe space for me. So to, to be able to change that relationship is, um, is a, a real, it's something I really look forward to. Um, the, the thing is, is that there's a bit of an ironic thing about the men being able to figure it out more than women, because women actually have the ability to float much, much more than when do men being generally more muscular or having and having less body fat are actually sinkers by nature. Um, they're just heavier in the water, but women, because we have, we have more fat tissues around our body. We actually have the ability to float a that, lot. More. That's a good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing. Let me tell you, I, I, the, some of the easiest floaters are the bigger busted women because they have just generally speaking that flotation. My friend calls it flotation devices, right? Um, but it, it, they, they're able to, to be in the water a lot more comfortably. And even when you look around um, in the in more serious swimming, when they talk about marathon swimming um, and open water swimming, when I was living in the UK, the persons who were doing open water swimming and the, the longer distances were persons with thicker body types who had more fat on them. And it wasn't, and those that actually worked to their advantage, not only to keep them more buoyant, but it's more energy reserves for longer swims too. Mm -hmm. So it's actually, it, it's, it's kind of funny how you know, in our culture, I guess boys seem to be more adventurous or it's encouraged or they're left on their own a little bit more than women are, where we're, we're encouraged to be we're channeled into other, other pathways, whether, and traditionally that's the home and stuff like that. But even today when that isn't such a big, it is not necessarily the greatest of impetuses, it's just more I just think sometimes adventure spirit isn't as encouraged or even seen as a thing that persons can gravitate to unless you know you're everything supported you, by it. Everything yeah. you're saying is resonating so hard with me. That that it's not I don't think it's that we are less adventurous. I think it's that we're socialized in a way that that the, as you said, the boys are left on their own more, maybe less so now than before. And the girls are, um, so you just kind of, 
sort of naturally develop that spirit of adventure and exploration. Do you think there's any way to what I said about the impact of class and race and any of that? Oh, definitely. Because that, that situation I was talking about, the, the, the legal issues where that was very racially tense. Um, it was a case where they wanted to have, uh, the swimming association at the time wanted to have a host OECS swim championships, I believe it was. I think that was what it was. And the challenge was they wanted to do it in a swim pool like they had done before. But the problem, I think, had to do with access to the pool. And it wasn't as easy access for some persons, generally persons from having a more the more Afro background to persons who are more Caucasian or more mixed heritage kind of thing. Um, or they, they kind of would gravitate to one club and those tend to be the pool clubs, whereas those with darker skin were end up being at the sea. And so- Because the sea is free. In, the, the, the beach is there. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. But the thing about it is, is that, and I don't know all the details to how this went down, but it just seemed that there was a, there was a deep, there, it just, however, the legal situation came about, it, it was very easy to see from outside looking in that there was on one side of the team, it was dark and sea-based and the other side of the team was lighter skinned and pool-based, right? So the optics of that, and it's not just optics, it's reality too, mm -hmm. right? And so, and it, but that doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's such a black and white situation, of course, but um, it was, it, it did have those undertones. What it's very much about the resources you have access to, because that's in swimming and as in many other things, but, but you see very clearly in swimming that the resources you have really determine your pathway. Because if you are able to invest, swimming is one of those sports where you have to put, it's, it's not just the money you put in, it's a parent's time, the parent's attention. So if, you, if your parents value what your progress and your extracurriculars and understand the value of education and sports combined together, and they, they willing, they're willing to invest in that, then and have the ability to invest in that, not only willing, but having the ability to do so, then the athlete is more likely to go further. I, I understand the privilege of my situation. I understand it. I've had been very, very fortunate to have parents who were able to, to support me in my own journey um, as, a, as an athlete. I'm very much I'm super grateful for that because I know it's not they, they it's not easy you have to for swimming if you when you start to get to the competitive level you have to be at you know four five six seven practices a, a week as you develop wow. and and me you're talking about going to getting waking up for at four o'clock in the morning to go to practice for five Right. And, you know, you need to then have vehicles because buses aren't necessarily going to be running at that point. Buses are may not be on the routes that you need to be going at. And then if you don't have. And we don't access, have buses that run on a schedule in Antigua. Exactly. <laughs> so the persons that in our club that need that rely on bus transport for the children know they have to carpool with other persons in the area. Or, at, or even if they're not even in the area, try to figure out a way to get from point A to point B so that children can get picked up so they can go to practice in the morning, then go to school after that, and then come back to practice in the afternoon and still have food and everything and stuff. So it's not, it's not an easy path at all. That's not a small um, point that you just made enough food, diet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That could be a privilege and a luxury as well. It is, because yeah, yeah. especially you swimmers, like as a swimmer, I burned through the house. Like I would, <laughs> you, the thing is my aunt, I lived in the Bahamas during some, most of my high school years to specifically train for swimming. And my, if she left the house for a day and I happened to be at home for the day because maybe it was exams times we had to study leave, she'd come back and there'd be no food in the house. Wow. Because I would have eaten it all off. I'm putting it nowhere because you're burning it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly.
do we do have to manage our expectations because we have to understand if we're not investing, we can't expect results. And investment comes over a period of time. And it it, it it's yes, you may have the odd, you might have like the odd kind of wild card kind of event happen every once in a while. You might see it in some islands where you get someone who meddles, but Generally speaking, if you want to predict your success, you have to create the investments there. Yeah. And we have not done that. But you have to know where to tap into. And then a lot of it has, it, a lot of it comes down to where you're going to, you need a system that can pump in money. And so you have to be creative with your system. And that itself requires a lot of vision and creativity in terms of, and not creativity in the fudging of books but creativity <laughs> but creativity in the way you see how you how you create value for persons and enough value that persons are you know you can create a system that makes sense yeah. like Barbados has their national lottery and for them that's where they put money they, they take money from their lottery and pump it into sport and so like the U.S. They do as well as they do sometimes because of they don't not only get corporate sponsorship, but they have TV rights on sports that help they pump back into their system. Yeah. So it's it's creating systematic money and income generation to to kind of fuel those those kind of investments in sport. So to sum up, we are on the resource, but we could be more creative than we're being if we prioritize sports. If we prioritize sports and if we have a leadership, if we have leadership that is willing to be upskilled, because I think that's a lot of it too. We not we are not we're not professional enough in our, our, our approach to sport. Um, we we do and, and part of that is that we again it comes down to the money because to be professional you have to now take it seriously as a job. But if you have other jobs that you're doing you're not necessarily, you can't really at the time put in the kind of work you need and professional development you need to get to be a professional coach or a professional yeah. sports scientist. Yeah. I mean, we have persons here who have been trained as sports scientists, sports psychologists, but they can't get work because we don't have a system that can fund them consistently. Yeah. been I think probably in our entire history I believe and I can't I'm saying that but not with any facts but I think we are at our greatest enrollment at least pre-COVID we're, we're at our greatest enrollment in swimming across different strata of 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 societies in Antigua um I think we we've we've come a long way from where we were back when I started like, I mean, the times we're starting to make, we're starting to medal at like places like at CC can championships, that's, you know, Central America, including. Um, we're, we've been meddling at CRIFTA at time to, time to time. That's really good for us because we have, we're coming against systems like in Trinidad and the Bahamas and Barbados who have existed a lot longer than we have. So we are coming up and generally speaking, we have more persons that are comfortable in the water. We have, we, we, we do have, but we have a lot of work to still do. I mean, we were doing a school program pre-COVID, um, which I, I was really happy to be a part of, that we had five pilot schools that we're teaching kids how to swim and we're taking them at primary is school, school is level. We, is, we, is it what I do? Um, no, it was, it was through the Swimming Federation. It was funded by um, the, the world, um, governing body for swimming. Uh -huh. um, we're able to secure us funding for that. And so it was instructors from various clubs, but it came, it was run on the Swimming Federation. And so there are a few of, I would say about maybe five or six instructors. Um, and we had classes three times a week um, after school for primary school students. Those not, we, uh -huh. you, you, we, kind, of, we kind of like took them at grades four, three and four, maybe three, four. And, and this was across the schools? Across public, private, private different communities. Um, no, these were these were these were public schools. 
So we had Villa, we had New Winthrop's, we had Tian Kernan, Potters, and Cedar Grove. Yeah. And the aim was to, as we see some of them, some you know stars coming through, those who are shining, to maybe funnel them into clubs as time would go on. Yeah. And if their parents were able to 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 commit to, to some of that as well. Not everybody can, we know that. But we give them the base skills mm -hmm. and those who are able to take it on at a more serious level, we encourage that. It's nice to get to see transitions and people grow, regardless of age, grow in confidence and grow in ability. I was going to ask you about transitions. Like if you can think of a story that, that when you think of, so, you know, we like to think our work has purpose. Um, when you think of a moment and purpose is not money it's not the same thing i mean you know it's seeing the fruits of your labor manifested in someone else i think to a certain degree so you're seeing someone discover that the sea can be a safe space or that the sea can be a magical space the way you see it we have experiences like that that you can share um well i have had to a degree. Now, the only challenge with me is just that I've been in and out of Antigua, so I have not been able to track the development of any one person right through, um, except for some of the competitive swimmers who I had a bit of input into. But I think of I think one of the first persons that come to mind is actually Jojo Nunes from who did who was in team um, the last rowing team that okay. came. Um, I remember teaching him as a small child. Um, how to swim and I remember really enjoying those classes and so I, it's kind of been interesting just seeing him take on the water world but he has had his other influences to take him there too but then what's been interesting has been to see when I'm on the beach I've seen persons that are of the school program who I know were, ter were not comfortable in the water and they're I see them in their swim caps, just me going to Fort James just randomly, and they would have a swim cap on, and they'd be right by the, by the just at the shoreline, um, practicing the things we would have taught them about even a year ago, even a year ago. And they would, and I, because I, we have branded swim caps, so I know who they are. And so if they have that swim cap in that program, and then I'll recognize them, and I'll be like, oh, okay, so you know they're doing stuff by themselves. And, you know, of course, with other persons in the water, right? But just to know that what you're teaching does translate into their lives is really, really rewarding. And it's very nice to see that it makes a difference. It really is. No, it is. And it's not just in the truth. It's not in the, only in the sense of, okay, there's the barrier that's created, right? But it's almost, there's a barrier anyway if you can't get in the water and understand what's in the water and enjoy what's in the water. It's, it's just, for me, I think it's very easy to have a fear of what you don't know. It's easy to understand, to have a fear of the fish, to have a fear of what's out there. And I had that fear too. And many swimmers have it, even our swimmers are, that know how to handle themselves in the water quite comfortably. You put them in the sea and it's a whole other matter. You tell them to go and swim in the deep, they're freaking out, right? We've had, after with COVID, when we had to take our sessions to the beach instead of being at the pool, we would have swimmers that would be crying as they're swimming because they're scared of what's underneath the water. And I had that it's, I had that fear as well, even though I didn't have as greatly as they do because that's all I grew up in was the sea. But I was afraid of the barracudas because you know apparently if you have they're attracted to shiny things. So if I happen to ha leave my earrings in, they could you know there's a there's a potential that they could be attracted to it thinking it's a fish, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, I was terrified of barracudas and and I didn't like not knowing what was under the sea. But once I got it was able to do the scuba diving. I took on, it took on a completely different relationship, completely different. So it wasn't so much about what I could see. It was how much as well, how did I feel about what I could see? And it was like, these animals were now interesting. They were now 
to be marveled at and to understand them more. That was, is trying to figure out, okay, this is their world. So how do they behave? How do they act? How do they just exist? So it's curiosity about them instead of fear. Mm -hmm. And that's been the biggest change that scuba diving gave me. I think it's a hard thing for persons to understand when they don't know. I honestly, un I, I, and I can appreciate, I, I, I can, so I can see how there's that disconnect and how we, how we treat things because we don't, we don't understand the beauty of it and we haven't had a chance or the even abilities to appreciate that beauty. And so I think for me to understand, I, 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 I really want to get persons to, to skill themselves up, to, to find those opportunities to, to learn and see what's underneath there so they can see for themselves what, what they're destroying. Because it's hard to know what you're destroying when you don't know. I really do understand that. I hear and you. So that's the first I hear thing. you, but I, I recently did an interview for this column out at the dockyard. And one of the things that we spoke about is all the people who are using the hiking trails more and mm. how they're seeing they're destroying them and more time. liquor and more vandalism and so on. So it's mm -hmm. like they're seeing it because the pillars of Hercules have been defaced. A lot yes, of, you know, I've heard of that. Yeah, people, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a good point. That is a good point. And even, and you, you can't, and you, at the same time, you can't wait for everybody to have this great experience on the water because not everybody will have it um, to, to be responsible about the water and what's in it. We can't. And so it's, I, I, I wonder what persons, I, I do wonder what would drive somebody to, to do two things, to just be careless and just, and literally in the, the true meaning of the, when you break it down, just not care about it, they care less about it and, and just not think about what they do. But then I also wonder what would it take for that person to actually care, mm. All right? Because I, I think education does have some, something to do with it, but it's also just as well, it's not just the education, it's the, the, the people you keep around you too, they have, you have to keep people, you have to keep other people accountable as well right it's your, your company also influences your actions and so if you yourself can be a voice of just saying you want to think about this again why are you doing this is it just voicing your disgust is a strong word but sometimes it's, it's needed um and just questioning persons on their actions and say why would you do this or why not think about XYZ. And you see what person's responses are, maybe. And but even you questioning, even you questioning can put pause in somebody's actions. Mm -hmm. Even questioning. This that this diving with sharks with scuba tank, which is really quite uh not. I can't say it's not an exhilarating thing, it is, but it's not as you, you feel more protected because you're generally with a group and as, a, as scuba divers, you learn how to handle sharks and you know what to do. You, 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 don't, um, you don't get all up in their face. You, if they're around you, you kind of stay still, let them do their thing and stuff. When you're free diving, you don't have those options because you're only on one breath of air, right? So I was in a situation where I was surrounded by sharks by choice. It was by choice because I went on a shark dive without, at, without, and it was one of those dives where, you know, you have those cages you've seen on TV, like they have people in the cages. I went outside of the cage because I was instructed to go outside the cage. But again, I was with persons who knew those sharks. Those persons knew how to handle those sharks and told me how to handle them. So again, it was managed risk, but that definitely is one of my, how did you feel? It felt very, I did it, I did it twice in one day. The first time I did it, I was quite nervous and the sharks can sense that. So you have to really work on like slowing down your heart rate and just trying to stay calm because they can sense the, the anxiety and tension and that keeps them, gets them more curious. Um, but once I got past them kind of 
just coming by and stuff. Um, by the second dive, I was super comfortable and I was actually like trying to like go down and meet them and like coming back up. And yeah, it was, that, that was, that was really fun. It was, it was, it was freeing to not be with equipment one and then free to just be with them out in the wild. It was really, 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 really like, I don't know. It felt exhilarating, exhilarating. Um, you also got to swim where a lot of people never get to swim because you went swimming out in the open Atlantic as a member of Team Antigua Island Girls, which is still yeah. an amazing, amazing thing. I'm so proud of you girls for that um, and for putting us on the map. I don't think y'all got nearly enough. I mean, I know y'all got a lot of kudos, but that should be like, there should be dolls and there should be books and there should be like a cartoon. I agree. So, I know. know, I know. <laughs> so, um, tell me about yeah. that. That was like, I'll tell you, but the swimming in the Atlantic was, it was colder than I expected, but not as cold as I thought it could be. So that's one. I thought it was going to be a lot colder, right? But it was cold. Um, and two, I don't know, it was like this magical thing where I just like, oh my gosh, I'm just like in this great expanse which is really, it was just, I felt very, very lucky to have the opportunity because I, I know a lot of people won't have that opportunity. Um, and so I felt very, very, I, I treasured it. So every time I went in the water, it was just like, okay. And also every time I was in the water, it was like relief because I was in the water and water is my element. So <laughs> it's just, it was, um, and also, you know, there are some advantages to that. I have to say my teammates really looked out for me because um, after cleaning, I would go in to clean the boat um, and of the barnacles on the sides of the boat. And when I came out, I was always rewarded with some chocolate, which is a very um, scarce commodity. Yeah. <laughs> so um, there was always that. So even if we're running low on resources, I would get some chocolate. <laughs> so there's advantage to that. <laughs> How has that changed your life, that experience? Or has it? Maybe it hasn't. I don't know. Um, it's given me more confidence in myself. Um, that, and I think, and that can sound very, it may not mean, it may not sound like it means a lot, but it does, it did for me because when I started, when I signed up for the role, my self-esteem was on the rocks. I was going through some really challenging times and I couldn't, I, I was, it was just very, very difficult in terms of just understanding who I was, where I was supposed to be. It was very confusing and I was, I was going through a really tough depression and I was just very lost, it felt. And then it, it's the role gave me like something to work towards, gave me a bit more purpose in life. And so by the time I had actually crossed it, I, really, I felt like as if I could really do anything I wanted to do, like anything. If I, it, it just, and it allowed me to see that I was able to work through a process of confidence building, which has extended beyond the time of the role. Mm. And I feel like it's, I, I was remarking on it even, I think, in my, and I was journaling over the last few days and that, you know, I've been able to be stronger because of what that role is able to represent for me. Uh -huh. um, and it, it kind of, it showed me that I could be stronger than my circumstances at the time. And I could, and I could, I could slowly, and it doesn't come overnight, but it's a slow process but it's a gradual one. And that's, and that's what was important. It was, it was just kept, it kept building, it kept building. My confidence in training kept building. And by the time I was on the ocean, I felt very, I, I just, I had a moment out there during one night that I felt like I wasn't supposed to be anywhere in the world except right there. Oh, wow. That. So that was just like this confirmation that I was like in the right place at the right time, somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic, you know, at dark at night with just the stars above me, but that's where I was supposed to be. And I had no, there was no doubt. 
that that it was just clarity there and I was like this is okay this is good I'm where I am in supposed to be in life right now which is great to know <laughs> yeah that is beautiful that is beautiful I'm writing a book right now but it's on it's been inspired by my role but it's not about the role it's not about the role but it's been inspired by what my experience have been of the role and it made me seek out experiences of others as well um in their relationship with the water so it's um it's not a book just about me it's a book about water people of the caribbean um i call them water humans <laughs> in my mind um but yeah it's so it's it's incorporates my story and incorporates a bit of the role but it incorporates everybody else's relationship to the water as well because i feel like so we need to share that more and not only do we need to share that it's just that other persons need to know that they're not alone i think all of our stories when i listen to our stories of persons who have gravitated to the water who are of the caribbean um they felt they've always felt outside like outsiders and because we are we are anomalies right but at the same time we didn't know each other existed mm -hmm. not until social media recently has opened up that world mm -hmm. and i feel like that we need to persons coming up not only need role models but they need to know people like these exist as well and so it's not such a strange thing to love the water and it's not such a strange thing to go after those kind of dreams when they seem unlikely and they seem like as if you're a crazy person for even wanting to think like that. It is water related. I haven't officially started, I've unofficially started, um, but it's actually taking me to Australia again at the same place I was at when I was training um, back in 2007 and eight. Um, so, uh, the PhD is about, um, the playful relationship to, to water actually, but through the lens of technology and how technology can help, um, help persons enjoy that playfulness and, and encourage that playfulness with the water. Um, so my, I have three projects I'll be working on. The first one is looking at pool-based environments and how um, we navigate those places, pool, the pool in interesting ways. Um, the next one is about, is on surfboards. So looking at how we can use surfboards and well, we, we haven't defined what that's going to be like. We just know it's going to be about surfing. That's as much as we know. Um, and then the third one is going to be on scuba diving. And so right now I'm, I'm writing a paper on recreational um, aquatic uh, activities and how technology supports those activities or does not support those activities because technology and water it seems to are generally speaking they don't work along very well but there's there are ways that we can look at it very interestingly so that's what my PhD will be about. Cool sounds extremely cool it doesn't actually sound like work it sounds like fun. Yeah I know it's work. I know it's work. So okay. fun. <laughs> but no, but if, if I had to, but definitely it's uh, one of the more exciting and more fun topics and the fact that, you know, get to play with water and kind of imagine it, it's what so far is pushing me very creatively and pushing me to imagine water from very different perspectives from what I would have ever considered, mm -hmm. which is new because for me, I'm just like, oh, I'm a water baby. Like I thought of everything there is to know about the water, but then I'm finding out, no, nope, there are more ways I can think about it in more creative and imaginative ways that it may actually benefit other persons later down the line. I have, I have a desire to, one, I want to tell our stories in a way that that captures our ancestral relationship with water because we do have good relationships with water. We do, we just have been disconnected and forgotten about it and not been told about it, but we do have it, right? And so it's a, I'd like to, to remind persons that we, we do have that, but do that in a way 
that technology can can enhance and can bring to life all right so it can be the beauty of what I'm doing is not one technology I'm, I'm looking at. I'm looking at a range of technologies. I'm looking at virtual reality, augmented reality. I'm looking at gaming. I'm looking at I'm looking at ways you can use installations um, and exhibits that are interactive with water. There's a whole range of technologies that exist out there that I want to marry with our our ancestral heritage of connection to water because it is there. Okay, so what the sea has given me is giving me a sense of belonging. It really has. That that's why I come away from it. It's it's community and belonging. Even as small as the community is, it's giving me that sense. Yeah. Well we lost our reefs. We definitely have lost that. We no, no, that. no, they're rebounding. No, they can rebound. They can rebound. They can. But let me say, I feel cheated to a degree because I hear stories about how beautiful our reefs were only 50 to 60 years ago. Not even that long. Not even that. Maybe even 30 years ago, which means that when I was born, the reefs were thriving, right? By the time I got to the diving part, I'm only seeing a, list, a fraction of what exists or used to exist. And now I probably am seeing even less of that. So I feel very cheated from discovering the things that like we were well, well known for and that we were just like, there was so much diversity and so much beauty under the water that I feel I've missed out on. And I'm just like, oh, it's like, you feel, it's almost like a, you have a memory of something that you can't really, that never existed because you never got a chance to exist, uh, to see it in existence, but you know, it was there. So it's like this memory, but you just, you can't put your hand on it and visualize it because you never had the chance to. And the functional value of the reefs is that they are the nursery for everything that, for everything. Would you agree? Am I? Yeah. Oh, they, 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 they protect. Our, but first of all, the reefs are what allow us to enjoy the waters as we enjoy them. First of all, just the calmness of the water, right? A lot of that is the reefs breaking and making the water then close to the shore calmer. That's one thing. Just for our pure enjoyment sake, that's one. Then, of course, you have reef as being where you have fish. And of course, the whole ecosystem of that, all right? And then you have, it, it's just kind of like, it's this, it's this barrier that protects and also this barrier that enriches the rest of everything that's out there as well. 